So I'm going to offer a couple reflections on uh, how we go about funding research infrastructure and how we think about those uh, funding mechanisms, and then offer a few recommendations as well. So briefly about me, I, I have a background in environmental science as well as public administration. And most of my education and my experience is actually more in public administration. But I have an early fascination with how we use and support research infrastructure. Um, for almost 20 years now, that's been my both passion and kind of professional mission. And my individual orientation is both as a practitioner and as a researcher, though I should note I'm not an environmental researcher. I'm more of a scholar in the realm of public administration, looking at how we administer science organizations, but especially research infrastructure. And I have experience coming from many different disciplines, um, but again, more as someone focused on the administration of resources than as a researcher in those fields. Oh, and the last thing is that is the photo noted in the previous one. Unlike many of my colleagues, I am not in the Bay Area. I'm in snowy Colorado. So about Phoenix, Phoenix really starts with the Arabidopsis information resource, which you'll see referred to as CARE. Now, CARE received about 14 years of funding from the National Science Foundation, and that really made the resource possible. Um, but there did ultimately come a time when that funding was going to end. And we, as an organization, were aware of that for some time and sought permission and the ability to use those remaining NSF funds to create a nonprofit entity called Phoenix Bioinformatics. And the first purpose of Phoenix was to ensure the sustainability of care for the users that had developed a, a close reliance on care for their research workflow. But the first thing that Phoenix had to do was to have a conversation and to develop relationships. And Phoenix chose to initially focus those conversations on academic libraries. As the uh, entity that had the best uh, understanding of uh, mechanisms to support the researchers in those universities. Now, the consequence of those conversations was a recognition that access and subscription management tools were not only a viable option, they were the best option, right? There was wide consideration of different community or user-directed funding that could sustain TEAR. Um, the subscription or uh, access management approach was deemed most viable. So as a consequence, TEAR moved to the subscription model. Now that resulted in the creation of a lot of subscription and access tools that were developed initially for TEAR but there was no reason that they were inherently limited or only applicable to TEAR. Um, from the get-go, there was an interest in making sure that anything developed at Phoenix would serve multiple projects or potentially partners. And as partners like the BioPsych project um, learned of these tools, there was an interest in potentially using them and in the case of BioPsych and several other partners, adult, uh, ultimately a partnership was developed. Now, I should say we started with uh, access management subscription model, uh, but since that initial founding, there have been an additional model developed that is fully open and can be thought of as a voluntary contribution. Uh, because certain institutions find the resource MorphoBank so valuable, they're willing to voluntarily contribute and make it available to everyone. Now, so what are some of the, the concrete lessons learned from the TEAR experience? First and foremost is that grant funding eventually ends for research infrastructure at some point. That being said, there is, or at least there can be, life after grant funding. 
and people will fundamentally pay for resources they value. Subscription support is an option. It can be sustainable. At least that is our experience and the path that Tear has gone down. Now, there are some uh, negative effects or at least a potential for negative effects if they are not managed moving to a subscription model, right? So folks often ask, you know, what about accessibility? And in the case of Tear, it's always available for free for teaching or educational purposes. And as other speakers have mentioned, we're, we're sensitive to uh, geographic and economic uh, resources and availability. Um, we also make it care freely available in the US to HBCUs, for example. We also believe that TEAR and the path we took for TEAR can be replicated. That's the inherent nature of our partner program. However, we do think the exact journey will be different. And lastly, as I mentioned earlier, subscriptions are not the only option for direct community funding or support. Um, we have already established a purely voluntarily voluntary institutional model as well. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of reflections on, on how the community is involved in funding infrastructure. And as I, I kind of noted in the back in the beginning, I have a background that um, you can view as more of a social science approach. And so I start with a, a clear explanation of my normative beliefs and lens when I come through. And it may not be your own, it may not be anyone else's, but I want to be transparent. And so fundamentally, I believe that science exists for societal benefit and that research infrastructure serves a community. Now, community is a reified concept, meaning we're taking something abstract and we're adding context to make it a very concrete thing. And that's important because the context or the approach to making it concrete can differ. And so these reflections could consider um, different funding sources. It could consider the uh, impact or the effect on users. But I chose to focus for this talk on different ways of conceiving community in community for funding infrastructure. The first approach is defining community, community deductively. So a model of what we mean by community is perhaps conceived first, and then we look for evidence that that's the right model and we perhaps shift it. I imagine this, this term is gonna be familiar to most. Community can also be defined inductively. So the opposite approach, you start with observations and that informs your model or theory of what the community around a research infrastructure looks like. And I would argue that projects, research infrastructure projects exist on a spectrum and yet they have a center of gravity. There may be those that are fully conceptualizing community deductively or fully inductively. Many are somewhere in the middle or aspects of both, but they have a center of gravity. At the same time, projects can move along the spectrum. Two minutes. So a deductive approach may utilize abstractions and representatives and collective deliberation to identify the needs or typical users. And it typically results in a finite number of funding organizations selecting a finite number of developers of research infrastructure. An inductive approach maintains agency for every user because a user is fully choosing what they incorporate in their workflow, what research infrastructure they use. But it results in an early emphasis in creating resources. It advances by increasing the understanding of users. And there's a nearly limitless number of possible developers because anyone can enter at any time. Phoenix supports the inductive approach. And we are very much structured with a public value nonprofit mission 
So, so some recommendations for moving to the inductive approach. First, start earlier than you can imagine. You may be more fully in the deductive approach with an abstract conception of your community of users. However, if you at any time want to move to the inductive approach with direct user support, it's always best to start thinking about that early. As they say, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Also understand both your personal and structural motivations and incentives. So people develop research infrastructure for multiple reasons. It can be a passion for supporting a particular discipline, but it can also be a passion for a particular technology. Either is appropriate, but it results in a different relationship with your community. And similarly, in the case of TARE, we chose one particular model for subscriptions. It incorporates institutions and individuals as an optional of, uh, as a user base. However, choosing either solely has a result in different incentives. This model also has a bias towards action. Reflections are important, but because the goal is to gain understanding about your user community, putting something out there and learning what they need uh, is the best way to proceed. And it is based on a multitude of individual choices. It is not a collective portrayal it is an accumulation of many, many individual choices to use or subscribe in the case of care, but ultimately to use a resource or not. Viability for this model increases with rising numbers of users and or more criticality. And by criticality, what I really mean is simply how essential is this resource to the user? Is it a nice to have or is it a must have? And inductive approaches can work in either the private sector or the public sector, though structural incentives do differ. For example, uh, one of the benefits to working with a, a nonprofit entity is there's never any fear of having uh, the company uh, bought or sold and no longer providing the service. In the case of Phoenix, sustainability for research infrastructure is what we are charged to do. And so that's always going to be our mission. And then one other, I, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about kind of a zone of viability uh, for moving to direct community support or funding. So you'll notice there's no numbers, there's no clear delineation here. And that's because it is a conceptual diagram, but the increasing number of users or increasing criticality will make a transition to this model, if not easier, more likely. You want to be in the upper right quadrant. And what looks, what is the threshold is going to be very different if it is a project that's got a budget of 500K compared to a project with a budget of 5 million, right? There's a very different number of uh, users that have to be willing to support it to meet that threshold. And with that, I would thank you. Uh, that's the end of my talk.